women continue to protest as the Taliban is now moving on with a nationwide crackdown on beauty salons. We will have more on this story later in the show. Hello and welcome. This is Inside South Asia and I am Dasini Atada. sent a senior official on a peace mission to Afghanistan in order to secure a deal to stop the spread of militant attacks by the tehreek e taliban Pakistan, also known as the TTP, that have been carried out in Balochistan and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. However, there appears to be a snub in this deal as the Taliban has now said that it is under no obligation to follow instructions from Islamabad. It is also added that the Doha deal is only with the United States and not with Pakistan. Here's more. Pakistan Special Envoy Asif Durrani in Kabul to raise serious concerns about safe havens to the Tehreek-e Taliban Pakistan in Afghanistan. Pakistan claims the terror outfit has killed 12 of its soldiers in two different attacks recently. Nine soldiers were killed after the TTP stormed an army base in Pakistan's southern Balochistan province. Another three were killed in exchange of fire. Calling the attacks intolerable, Pakistan has warned of an effective response by its security forces. However, the Taliban has denied providing any safe havens to the TTP and has also asked for concrete evidence. Baluchistan is a mineral-rich region that has been troubled by decades of insurgency. In fact, the White House also spoke about the incident, saying there is no indication that the Afghan refugees in Pakistan or along its borders have engaged in acts of extremism. Interestingly, though, a video is doing the rounds in Pakistan which shows American arms being used by the TTP, implying that they were passed on by the Afghan Taliban. Pakistan claims that two regions have seen a spike in violence since the TTP called off its ceasefire with Islamabad in November last year, which are Baluchistan and Khyber Pakhtunwa. The Pakistan Army held a co-commander meeting chaired by the Army Chief General Syed Asim Munir himself where it concluded that the sanctuaries and liberty being provided to the TTP and other groups was impacting the security of Pakistan. So who are the Pakistan Taliban? The TTP is considered a separate group from the Afghan Taliban with links to the Afghan Taliban. The outfit has intensified its attacks against the Pakistan security forces since last November when it unilaterally called off a truce brokered by the Afghan Taliban. Islamabad blames the TTP's activities on the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan, alleging that many of its top commanders have fled to Afghanistan from their stronghold in North Waziristan that has been under attack from Pakistan agencies. In a recent interview to BBC Pashto, the Taliban spokesperson said that the terrorist group did not sign the Doha Peace Accord with Islamabad in an apparent snub to the government of Pakistan. So does this mean that the Taliban offshoots will continue to operate in the region? The Asia Cup schedule is out and India is all set to take on Pakistan on the 2nd of September. Up next, we take a look at all other stories that have made headlines in South Asia. Work, food, justice. This was the slogan of dozens of Afghan women who took to the streets in Kabul to protest against the nationwide ban on beauty salons. There is a gathering of women. We are waiting for more makeup artists to arrive for justice. We want work, food and freedom. Six 
Security forces used fire hose and tasers, fired their guns into the air to disperse the crowd. The latest diktat by the Taliban targeted beauty salons saying they offer services forbidden by Islam and cause economic hardship for grooms' families during wedding festivities. Earlier this month, the Taliban said all salons in Afghanistan had one month to wind down their businesses and close shop. The order is the latest in a series of measures initiated by the Taliban trampling women's rights. The match schedule for the Asia Cup cricket tournament is out. Pakistan retains hosting rights but will stage only four of the 13 matches in this biennial competition. The decision was taken after a prolonged tussle between the cricket boards of India and Pakistan. Other countries sending teams to the competition are Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, Bangladesh and Nepal. All eyes will be on the big ticket India-Pakistan clash in Kandy, Sri Lanka on the 2nd of September. The final will be played in Colombo. Assam state in India is on high alert with release of water from Bhutan's Kurachur Dam. The flood situation has worsened in the northeastern state as water levels in major rivers continue to rise. The Brahmaputra is flowing above the danger mark at several places. The river Beki, which originates from Bhutan and flows through India, also recorded dangerous levels. Some 500 families have been evacuated from villages along the foothills in Bhutan. The second phase of the Jainagar Bijalpura Bardibas cross border rail line project in Nepal has been inaugurated. The Kurta Bijalpura rail section, which covers a total of 17.3 kilometers, is being constructed under the grant assistance from the Government of India. The first phase from Jainagar in India's Bihar to Kurta in Nepal was inaugurated in April last year and has been operational since. This rail link will provide a big boost to trade and tourism between India and Nepal. A full six years after hundreds of thousands of a Rohingya community were forced out of their homes from Rakhine, Myanmar, human rights activists have now sounded the alarm and have questioned for their safety, even if they are to return home. For the million or so of Rohingya living in Bangladesh, their dreams of returning back to their hometowns are riddled with holes of uncertainty. Here's more. We support efforts to create the conditions for eventual, safe, dignified, informed, and voluntary return of Rohingya, conditions that do not currently exist. The U.S. Under Secretary for Human Rights on a visit to Bangladesh spells out the reality of millions of Rohingyas living here who raise a voice to go home. This demonstration held in the sprawling Cox's Bazaar camp on World Refugee Day last month show up the desperation of Rohingyas marooned in Bangladesh for six years now. These people are not officially recognized as refugees here because Bangladesh is not a signatory to the 1951 convention or its 1967 refugee protocol. They're not eligible to refugee rights and want to go home. <laughs> We want repatriation soon, which will be a dignified repatriation. Where we are living now, it is like hell. We want to go back to our home where we were born. We call the international community to solve the problem soon and help us get repatriated. But is it really as simple as transporting the Rohingya back home? Experts point out that the issue extends to complex and multifaceted questions around conditions in Myanmar, safety and beyond. Having faced systemic persecution and discrimination for years, any repatriation plan for Rohingyas must consider the prospects for their integration, access to fundamental rights and the restoration of their dignity in Myanmar. The situation in Burma is still genocide is ongoing. Rohingya 600,000 who are in Burma, in Rakhine state, they are facing genocide. So, and when you talk about repatriation, we need to focus on what condition they can go. But they are 
there are no such a condition they can return because while the situation is really bad in Rakhine state, why what I mentioned, genocide is ongoing, restriction of movement, restriction on Mary, restriction on education, and you know, not uh, recognizing, not restoring their citizenship rights, not allowing them to return their original place. These are really important points we need to emphasize all. A Myanmar government team visited Bangladesh in May this year to initiate a repatriation plan, a pilot of sorts. Genuine intention or just a show of respecting human rights? How interested really is the military government in Myanmar in bringing peace and restoring rights for the Rohingya? Is it a question now of global pressure? Are the Rohingya willing to return to Myanmar to live as non-citizens, essentially move from one camp to another? Repatriation, in its real sense, has a long way to go yet. Up next, we bring you the story of Pakistan mountaineer Sharoz Kashif, who is determined to climb all 14 peaks above 8,000 meters. We spoke to him to ask about his ambition in climbing and how it will change the outlook of mountain climbing in his country. Here's his story. This is Shehroz Kashif, a 21-year-old mountaineer from Pakistan. Kashif is on a mission to become the world's youngest person to climb every peak above 8,000 meters. But the big question is, can he achieve this feat? In April this year, Kashif became the youngest mountaineer to summit 11 peaks above 8,000 meters. After he scaled Annapurna, the world's 10th tallest mountain located in Nepal, a month later he conquered Mount Tholagiri. He's now eyeing a new record, conquering all of Asia's high altitude peaks. He's used to the sub zero temperatures and biting winds on dangerous slopes. A bigger challenge is finding the funds to fulfill his dream. The, the main struggle for me was that I couldn't understand how government can chip in and our private sector can chip in. So I used to think that government used to fund you and, you know, the government used to take over all possibility of few thousands. But this is not the way. Actually, what governments do, governments own the expedition and private sectors chip in. It can be a, it can be expedition like Pakistan's expedition or Pakistan on Everest like this. But I used to misunderstand this. But now, uh, for a middle class boy like me, actually, uh, I I sold my car and a piece of land uh, to climb Everest because you know I couldn't get it right that how to get sponsors, and I was a bit disappointed from private sectors as well. Kashif's own finances somewhere reflect that of his country. Pakistan struggling with global debt resonates in his own story too. The youth's father did all he could to ensure he never gave up on his dream. He sold his car to arrange money for Sheroz's Everest climb. The money helped him summit Everest in 2021, making him the youngest Pakistani to do so. It was for my father. And, but somehow my father managed to get in and he always supported me in every part of my life. I was carrying the Pakistani flag and I was singing the national anthem as well. So, uh, yeah, uh, government actually did support me uh, in a way that they morally support me. Just two months after he conquered Mount Everest, he scaled K2, becoming the youngest climber in the world to achieve this feat. That made it two big records in a single year. Sheroz Kashif's mountaineering journey had started when he was just 11, when most boys in his neighbourhood were busy with street cricket. The major debut climb was the 3,885-metre Himalayan peak, Makra, in northern Pakistan. I started from 3,000 metres and gradually I submitted 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 and then I took my training and then 8,000. So, you know, it happens like this. Within 10 years, boom, <laughs> I climbed 12,000 metres peak. So. But the challenge remains, there can be no underestimating the costs attached. 
Scaling high altitude peaks is an expensive affair with costs running into hundreds of thousands of dollars. There are only some 50 people who've conquered all the 14 so-called super peaks. Sheroz Kashif is just two peaks away from adding his name to this coveted list of climbers. And he believes his making it there will come as a big boost to all Pakistani mountaineers. Actually, the preferences are different. I agree that. But the thing is that a lot of people are doing mountaineering right now. A lot of people, th those are belong to the villages and those are belong to, you know, uh, not well of family. They are doing mountaineering as well. They are, and they are doing 8,000 meters and uh, they are making such a good record. have wreaked havoc in large parts of North India over the past two weeks. Yet not too far away, in a near state of Western India's Maharashtra, farmers are facing a different rain-related calamity. Lack of rain has impacted farmers greatly, with sugarcane growers' worst hit. Here's more. Sugarcane farmer Datatri Jagdeep sees massive irony in news and pictures of rains and floods in Mumbai, just 200 kilometers away. Because his 2.75 acres of land in Maharashtra's Pune district has got barely any rain. He's already spent some 2 lakh rupees, that's nearly $2,500 on his sugarcane field this year. And things don't look good ahead. Since two months I have prepared the land, but due to a lack of rainfall, I am unable to start the plantation. There are no rains, no water in the wells as well. I come every day to my farm and see it getting dry day by day due to lack of water. I am helpless as two months have already been wasted. Maharashtra state in India ranks as India's number one sugar producer. And monsoon rains in the region between June and September form a lifeblood. Not so this year. Rains are 71% less than normal, and that's taking a toll. If this situation continues for a longer period of time, as the weather forecast says that there is at least a week for few of these districts to receive good amount of rainfall, then the farmers say the situation could get more worse for the upcoming season. And not just farmers. Labourers working on a daily wage get very little work. Baban Jadav banks on these couple of months for the little he's able to save. As it is though, there's no work and no daily bread. Our conditions are very poor. I earn only two and a half to four dollars a day by doing labour work at sugarcane fields. It is very difficult to survive. The state of affairs, a near repeat of 2022, tells on the yield. Sugar output for Maharashtra was predicted at 13.8 million tonnes for the 2022 and 2023 marketing year. The actual production due to a depleted sugarcane crop was just about 10.5 million tonnes. The authorities fear things will be worse this year. Last year, in the month of May, June and July, we had seen decent 140 mm of rains. But this year, in the same period, we have seen only 20 mm of rain in these affected districts. The upcoming crushing season is going to be affected in a huge way due to lack of rainfall. So the question is, is sugar cane and hence sugar going the tomatoes way? Tomato prices have hit an all-time high across India, up to nine times the normal. The experts believe that sugarcane could have a similar fate. When people smell the shortage of the sugar spikes, the prices of the sugar will start spurting. And now this time, even if you see the international prices, they are hovering around 50 to 55 rupees kg. And India has been one of the exporters of the sugar into the world market. 
two extremes, both deadly, both a nightmare, that threaten to return again and again. The climate change spectre beats on the door hard. Act now or else. Climate extremes and no lessons learned yet. Well, that's all we have for you on our show this week. Do tune in next week as well. For the Weon team, I'm Dasmiya Powder, signing off.